other than maybe uh, this would be a good point to say, how did this uh, get started or why, why did I do this? <clears throat> and it was a little bit of uh, where I came from. So, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience with seeing how much security can be improved by looking at it from the attacker's perspective. You know, I, I definitely believe um, if you don't understand your adversary, you are going to have a lot of trouble protecting against it. And if you don't know what you're protecting, you will not be able to protect it. Like if you don't know it exists, you're not going <laughs> to not going to be able to protect it. So <clears throat> situational awareness is really important. Visibility is really important. And when I needed more of this for myself, uh, working with clients, it just, uh, this is about four years ago, actually, uh, next week. <clears throat> yeah, there, this was a bit of a gap or the, the capabilities were lacking. So I created this a little bit for myself initially and, and the work I was doing, uh, but then quickly felt like we should uh, contribute this to the community. It took about a year after that for OWASP to uh, notice it and then we uh, made it an OWASP project. So what exactly is the MS uh, project though? So put simply, or as simply as you can uh, describe it, I think it's a tax surface mapping. That, that's what this project has always been about. It's about getting the most complete picture possible of an organization or a namespaces attack surface on the internet. <clears throat> So specifically what this uh, tool does is it ingests information that's available uh, from the internet, such as OSINT data sources, and it does some techniques, you know, implements some techniques to then continue investigating uh, these exposed, exposed assets. But then, uh, it continues to make this information, say, more usable by implementing tracking features, which um, allow, an, or it could be a user or an organization to answer questions like, okay, we have you know thousands of discovered assets, which ones are new? You know, which ones have we, were we not aware of you know th these are it's um you know nobody wants to go through all the data right that's what it boils down to too so tracking allows you to get quick answers to those kinds of questions we also have uh visualization so that if you are not just doing this continuously and you know looking for changes but it's actually a little bit more of an investigative uh, stage, say, of your your OSINT work. Then uh, the visualization can be really helpful because it allows you to uh, see what other organizations the target organization is uh, connected with, or what networks the assets reside on. And therefore, there could be maybe more assets that, or more namespaces that you weren't aware of. Uh, by using the visualization, I think it makes it really easy to quickly spot those things <clears throat> and then expand the scope of your uh, numerations. And then last on here, but definitely uh, not least, uh, this tool started out, you know, like many things, uh, limited to, you know, what we were writing ourselves <clears throat> but it's now extendable so if you, if a user or an organization has its own data sources uh, they can now roll that in to their use of the MS project and we'll we're going to touch on all these things a little bit more um, in the upcoming slides so Really, this, this all, like I said, happened about four years ago, and <clears throat> it was around the same time when it seemed like people were finally 
recognizing that this was an essential essential part of a security program. I mean, it for quite a while it seemed like attack surface management was not considered <clears throat> a necessary part of a mature security program. But as I said at the beginning, uh, if you're missing this <clears throat> information, you know you're going to have trouble making some really important decisions. For instance, if you don't know what you look like to a threat actor or an adversary, uh, how do you answer the question of which assets are most likely to be attacked? <clears throat> or do we have the assets that are most likely to be attacked hardened to the level that you know we're comfortable with? What about, um, do we even know everything that's exposed on the internet? <clears throat> Which, that perhaps that sounds uh, silly, <laughs> but I have yet to work with any company uh, where when that question comes up, that the answer was they knew ev everything that was exposed. <clears throat> Every single company I've ever worked with and helped them with this, uh, we ended up discovering many more assets that were publicly reachable and they were not aware of it. So th this is a very serious problem. Um, and a lot of it, <clears throat> as I uh, say here, it, it comes from this ongoing issue of asset inventory is rarely ever up to date with what's actually deployed. I mean, it's, it's kind of that simple. And that's why you need attack surface management in order to make sure that you're staying on top of not what you think is deployed, but what is actually deployed, <clears throat> what's really uh, out there right now. You might, you could kind of call it what's in the, what's out in the field versus, you know, what you hoped was out in the field. As I said, I mean, I guess uh, what I, I'm always pinching myself that this doesn't seem a little bit more like, well, of course, right? You, when you're listening to this, perhaps you think, well, yeah, doesn't, wouldn't everyone look at it this way? But it's, this has not been a priority um, for a lot of companies until the last couple of years. And this project has attempted to help that movement to put the spotlight on the importance of attack surface management and kind of lead the charge, at least from the open source community um, on how important this really is. Like I say here in the, the subtitle, you can't protect something if you don't know that you have it out there, right? If, it, if you don't know it's exposed, if you don't know it's been deployed or you, it's been, you know, this has happened and you weren't made aware of it, or the right teams weren't made aware of it, then it could just be out there on its own, so to speak. <clears throat> like uh, I mentioned earlier, this happens more than perhaps you would think. And it's just, frankly, I think unacceptable, um, especially when there's ways we can deal with this. So another uh, focus of this project is there's a lot of places where you can get data about what's on the internet. And there's a lot of ways that you can attempt to enumerate what's on the internet. Amass currently uh, supports 70 or more different uh, data sources out of the box. So it's quite a bit of uh, work maintaining all of these different data sources and making sure that they're all working correctly and we're taking full advantage of them uh, when they make you know, changes that we're uh, updating the AMAS tool uh, as well so that we're continuing you know, to use these data sources correctly. <clears throat> a lot of that has um, been made a little easier by establishing uh, better relationships with the organizations that uh, own these data sources. But at the end of the day, it really is 
we have a lot of contributors on this project and everyone is working hard to try to keep uh, all of this up to date and add new data sources as we're as we learn of their existence you know we definitely started off with far fewer than 70 <clears throat> and it's been a mixture of just hard work on this project and a strong community around this tool that has uh, made it possible to expand it to what it is today. Uh, like it says here, you could think of the data we're getting from these data sources as uh, the trampoline stage of the enumeration where you know we start off with all this data we're getting from uh, data you know these data sources or services and then <clears throat> the tool continues to investigate these namespaces and uh, the infrastructure in order to attempt to reveal more assets that perhaps the data sources didn't know about using all sorts of different techniques like you know I listed I mentioned here DNS zone transfers uh, you know we have zone walking we have uh, pulling TLS certificates crawling web pages there's all sorts of things that <clears throat> have been implemented that attempt to uh, glean additional uh, information about the target organization's namespace and infrastructure. All right, moving along, uh, tracking again. So, yeah, th this was um, this tool, you know, was quite powerful when you know as we continued to expand it, but it created this uh, new problem, which is. We had more data than we knew what to do with, right? Or most, you know, most users were saying there's so much data, and they just want, um, for instance, what's been removed, what's been moved, and what's new, right? Like these were the changes that they wanted to be informed about or informed of. Otherwise, it, it is like trying to find a needle in, in a haystack. <clears throat> so these tracking uh, capabilities or features um, are possible because a mass does not just enumerate this information and then print it out and wash its hands and terminate. It's storing all this information in a graph database. And if you run your enumeration, let's say, I mean, it could be every day, it could be every week, <clears throat> it could be continuously, whatever, whatever makes sense for your um, security program. It's storing every single enumeration in the database and all that is available to us. And we can, you know, look at what was different from one enumeration to the next. It also helps us to make sure that everything we knew previously is being considered in the future enumerations so that we get consistency across the um, investigations or enumerations. So that it, when we say something's changed from one to the next, uh, you know, you can at least know, and we knew everything this time that we knew previously. <clears throat> so if it if we didn't find it, there's a, you know, pretty high percentage chance that that means it's because it's gone now. The uh, the other interesting things we can do with this, and you know, I'll talk more about this at the end, is that. There's other ways that there's other questions you can answer other than <clears throat> did we lose assets or did they move or or are they new? You can also answer questions such as which assets were known by the largest number of data sources. Or another way to look at that or, or say that could be which of these assets are most likely to be discovered by an adversary. That could be a very interesting question to answer, I think, because it could help you prioritize which would are most likely to become targets in a, say, targeted campaign or, or just if someone's quickly doing um, this type of activity, you know, which, which of these are most likely to show up on their radar. You could also, for instance, um, use this source information to say, well, we're going to pull in our own asset inventory information to the mass project or the mass tool 
along with all the things that we're learning from the internet and we will compare what was known from our in by our inventory versus what we found out from all the other sources the delta could reveal what our inventory isn't accounting for <clears throat> and therefore places where we need to uh, update stale information or just missing information so these are areas where we've attempted to you know not simply enumerate what is available but to reveal where security um, programs have say gaps in, in their own intelligence or information that they are working off of. I mean asset inventory is really a such a fundamental uh, capability right <clears throat> that all of IT and security and others uh, rely on and anything we could do to shed light on where these say improvements need to be made I think most people would agree is beneficial and worth the cycles to make the, make the changes all right so what we have here is so a couple things personally i'm a very visual uh person i found it uh early on in the life of this tool to it was beneficial to have visualization Perhaps part of that too is that uh, prior to this tool existing, you know, I was a big fan of Maltigo. I was used to this uh, process, say, of let's find the targets and let's see what this looks like, right? Or see where they are, <clears throat> things like that. So when this tool was created and we were able to get even more information, it seemed even more important that we were able to see it. But also, uh, I kind of, I really believe in this uh, quote here that's underneath the title of this slide, which is, again, this is how attackers look at your organization. If you're on the defender, you know, if you're a defender, <clears throat> it's beneficial, I think, to view your own organization the way the threat actor will. In order for you to help uh, to help you understand what they're likely to be thinking when they're considering you as a target so this this can be good just to review if you're on the blue side in order to understand what you look like to uh, an attacker it's obviously uh, also quite beneficial <clears throat> if you're an offensive security professional and you just want to be able to look at your target and get a quick idea of you know what would be say good to look at initially as a low-hanging fruit for for your uh, target organization <clears throat> but also if you're let's say you're just starting your investigation um and you're and you're willing to expand the scope of what you're doing The visualization allows you to expand the scope. You know, it allows you to find additional namespace. Uh, yes, if you are considering expanding the scope of your investigation, I personally find it easier to see what, uh, for instance, networks could be added to the scope and um, where you could find additional namespace by looking at the visualization and cons uh, considering those things for future enumerations. All right. So I mentioned this uh, briefly in the beginning but this has turned out to be uh, quite important. So extendability, you know, we've tried very hard to, um, you know, try to get all the information we can possibly find out about and um, make available to users. You know, we, like I said, we have over 70 different data sources. 
not all of them are necessarily uh, free for use. Some of them you know, require having accounts with the service providers, but all the same, uh, we've done everything we can to try and bring in all the data to our users. But <clears throat> there's always the possibility we could be missing something. There could be data sources that they have access to that we just don't know about, or you know, that could be internal. So we added um, embedded scripting, very similar, I would say, to uh, the way Nmap offers this to users. And we've moved a lot of our own implementations of these uh, data sources at, uh, to, be, to be scripts now in this scripting engine. <clears throat> so a couple advantages, I, I guess, of this. I mean, the obvious one being users have the ability to ex extend the tool, which, uh, you know, I think the big, the place where that can be a, a really important um, feature is when they want to bring in their own asset inventory <clears throat> to be considered in the the uh, the attack surface uh, mapping. But for instance, uh, I've heard stories where testers have said <clears throat> they've taken their own custom tools that you know are, are looking at the targets a little differently, and they've wrapped those tools in uh, mass scripts and then pulled the data into a mass so that it's, it's adding to the, say, complete picture. So, you know, this is one more, uh, again, important uh, reason I think to have this is these scripts are so much easier to write. I mean, they're, they're shorter. Uh, there's a lot of examples of them. So it's very easy for someone to, you know, look at one of these and then write a new one. And, it really allows the the person writing it, the developer, to focus on the data source and how it works and not how a mass works. <clears throat> so it makes it quicker for people to contribute uh, new data sources or to enhance our implementation for existing sources. And it's it's really been an important addition to this uh, this tool. All right. So what, what do we want to do now? I mean, I th many people have said that um, this project has been quite successful in helping bring attack surface management, at least from the open, you know, as an open source contribution, um, you know, to the community, that it's, it's helped shed light on how important attack surface management is. And of course, we would, we would like to continue uh, bringing that value to the community, both uh, from the perspective of, you know, as a use case, a, a very, say, popular use case is uh, bug bounty hunters love this tool. And it's helping them find targets that are in scope of bug bounty programs to then test uh, web applications. So, you know, if you're at least within the context of bug bounty hunting, uh, that seems to be a pretty important uh, step, right? Is that we're getting all the, the possible targets so that they can be uh, assessed properly. But we also hear lots of people saying how they're uh, you know, putting the MS tool into their continuous security and continuous monitoring pipelines so that they are always getting up-to-date information on uh, what's actually exposed on the internet. But what can we do to bring additional value or just make this uh, easier for people in the future, I guess, is what we're thinking at the moment. Uh, I think, you know, people have, shared with us that this tool has become kind of, well, the, the exact words I've heard some people use is, it's a bit of a, a beast, right? Because it does a lot. And there's a lot you could find yourself learning if you're trying to take full advantage of it. And I think for some users, 
it would just be easier if there was a you know a, like a web UI to make this a bit more point and click. <clears throat> so this is on our um, to do list. While I'm not you know personally I'm not much of a front end developer, uh, we have a lot of contributors on this project, and of course we're always looking for more. Uh, but I think we can definitely you know, at least get a first stab at this um, in the near future. The part that I'm a little, uh, is a little bit closer to me, or I'd definitely like to see, um, you know, a focus on the, you know, within the project on this is, what are we doing with the data that we're collecting? So we have a lot of this powerful data. We have, um, you know, it's all, in a graph database where we have these relationships uh, between the assets and what we're discovering, you know, all the discoveries. We're already doing quite a bit with this, but it, it just seems like there's so much potential to do more and make it easy for users to glean more useful information from what we've collected. So that's kind of uh, what I've been thinking about more lately and trying to get more contributors focused on. Uh, but the truth is we, we have plenty of contributors that are, they've kind of taken ownership of uh, maintaining the uh, data sources and, and making sure our integrations are strong. Uh, I've sp been spending a lot of my time on this project, maintaining um, relationships with the service providers to make sure that, you know, if there's gonna be upcoming changes that we, you know, we're aware of those, uh, in advance so that you know like i said earlier we can offer a certain amount of say reliability <clears throat> with this tool and we don't have things changing out from under us so that's actually been consuming quite a bit of my own time um, that i have to put towards this project but it's just going to have to keep happening i mean it's this is a high maintenance uh, project, but so many people are using it every day that it seems uh, definitely worth maintaining it. Now, I think if I were doing uh, this slide justice, I think some people in OWASP would say, I should have put a bullet in here about future integrations with other OWASP projects. There's been some discussion of uh, integrating with other I'll, I'll call them, let's see, tools that are useful to offensive security professionals uh, that help in the assessment, uh, you know, with security assessment. I think Amass uh, helps give those tools scope and makes it possible for them to know what targets are out there so that they can then take it to the next level and you know, investigate those targets and make sure that they don't have vulnerabilities. So I probably should have uh, included that because that's definitely been coming up again and again in uh, recent discussions. I just don't honestly have timelines on when that's likely to happen, but I'm looking forward to uh, those integrations. All right, with that, I guess I'll I'll bring it to questions. I think we have five minutes for questions and any questions that we don't have time for uh, here, I've been told that you can bring it to that channel uh, within our Slack and I'll be there to uh, help answer the questions.